Thanks for staying up. Later, Jerry Seinfeld is back for an encore performance, nightcap of his later doubleheader. And since the last time, you got your own show. That's right. Which says something about the way your career is going. It's moving up to the east side. That's right. Deluxe apartment <laughs> in the sky. Who wrote that? That has to be one of, one of the great theme songs in the yeah. history of situation comedy. That was good. That was kind of a, it kind of got you into the show. Always that shot of him walking away from you at the end with the elbows going behind him. And, and how did George Jefferson make his fortune? Dry yeah. cleaning. A series of dr a chain of dry cleaning shops. Which is a myth, by the way. Dry cleaning. Do you believe it? We all, they tell us that they're not wetting it. Yeah. But I have a feeling that they're wetting it. It, it, suppose you just dropped, the, yours is white, suppose you just dropped a big glop of goo yeah. all over the front of your shirt. How are they going to get that yeah. out just by dry Clean it cleaning out it? And don't wet it. This is what we're asking them to do. My fear is that the dry cleaners are wearing my clothes. Because I can't understand what is taking four days. <laughs> you know? And I, I have this fantasy that I'm going to just bump into a dry cleaner at a party and he's going to be wearing my sweater. And I'll be able to go. That better be ready by tomorrow. Let's talk about your show. Okay, I got, I got a show. I got a shot, Bob. I'm getting my at-bat here on the network. 9.30 tomorrow night, Thursday night, yeah. right after Cheers. So right. You got the lead-in. Yeah, they like the show. It's a funny show. It's a simple show. It's a show about us. It's a show about being a comic. I, see, everyone always asks me, how do you get your material? And uh, what is it like being a comic? It must be horrible, you know? And it's not. It's a fun, enjoyable life. And material is, comes from every single thing that you do, if you're a comic. So that's the jumping off point of the show, that these are things that happen to me. We act them out in a sitcom type of format, but they're very mundane things. I, go, I look for an apartment, my, I, I go to the dry cleaner, my, I, uh, I meet a girl. I mean, there's nothing happening in these shows. Your apartment gets robbed, which has actually happened robbed. to you. Yeah, that's happened. And then How many have times have you personally been robbed? Been thieved? Thieved. Pilfered. 18 times? The radios in my car. You, you know, in New York now, it's just no radio, no radio. Right. I wonder about the DJs. How do they feel? When they come out after a hard day mixing <laughs> records, and they just, wherever they go, no radio. I saw one, no radio, thank you. I had, this is a real, somebody put that like, we're going to try being polite mm -hmm. to the crooks. You know, sorry to disappoint you, Mr. Crack Addict, sir. <laughs> I hope you're not upset, you know. It's sort of an extension of thank you for not smoking. Yeah. Thank you right. for not raping and plundering. <laughs> yeah. We're trying anything in this town. Julia Louis-Dreyfus is in the show with you. Uh, mm. Used to be in Saturday Night Live. What a creamsicle she is. What a sweet <laughs> piece of pecan pie. <laughs> well, where did that come from? <laughs> Nobody in my high school ever said that. I just learned that last week. Uh, yeah, she's, she's from uh, Saturday Night Live. <laughs> it was a profitable week for you then. <laughs> she's from, uh, she had a ser series, and uh, Michael Richards and Jason Alexander are also in the show. All these very funny people, very funny people. These people are, are, are funnier than I am, and they can all act. Which is hard to imagine. Yeah, no, they, they're very funny. I gave them all the best lines. I have no lines in this show. <laughs> But it, opens, my own show. it opens with you on stage doing right. your stand-up act and then dissolves into the situation. Right, I get to do the stand-up, so the rest of the jokes I give to the other guys. It's a four-week run, Yeah. first two have aired, third one is tomorrow night, and what happens after that? I don't know. I'm back here. I'm trying to get a, back on here, trying to <laughs> talk about Batman, I guess. <laughs> is there a chance it could be a, become a regular series in the fall? There's a chance, sure. There's a chance. There's a chance of anything, really. Is that what you'd like to do? Wouldn't it cut into the 300 or so dates you do no. every, every year on the road? Why would it cut into it? Just because I'm writing 12 hours a day, rehearsing? Exactly. Now, how could that possibly cut in? I, I, I don't know. These are the questions that you get when you do interviews with people like this, or anyone you interview. If you ever go into show business, you will be faced with questions with, like this. Basically, let's not beat around the bush. We're talking about dumb Bad. interview questions. Questions. Really bad questions. Now, the guy knows. He knows that I tour 300 dates a year. He also knows that to do a TV series requires five days at least of being in town rehearsing and writing and performing. He asked me, do you think it's going to cut in? <laughs> now, here's a question. I've been doing a lot of a interviews. very stupid question. Now, here's a, here's a but stupid it takes one. a lot to shame <laughs> a guy like me. Here's a question I got the other day. 
from a guy. This is a legitimate question from a newspaper. The guy says to me, I'm not even embellishing this in any way. Right. The guy says, Jerry, you tour a lot, you're a comedian, you've been to a lot of cities, what do you find? <laughs> that was the question. What do you find? What do you find? Is he referring to loose articles that you might find, you know, stuck between the seats <laughs> of, of uh, a car, or what's he talking find, about? Do you find, yeah, do you find a lot of loose change in the cushions, or, I mean... Well, <laughs> but what do you find? What do you <laughs> find in Cleveland as opposed to Mobile? You find, I'll tell you one thing I love, people will sometimes come up to you after a show, and they go, that was funny, are you from around here? <laughs> I get this a lot, like you would be down the block doing your cleaning, at the laundromat, right? You wander into this club, somehow find yourself on stage, do an hour and fifteen minutes without pausing, and then you're just wandering out again. Are we out of time? <laughs> how are we doing on time? Every talk show host has no idea how much time is in his show. Why? I have no why idea. do you guys not know that? Well, look at it's this an, guy. It's a half hour. Come here. Just walk right up here. Just step right up here. He's a very bashful man. Just hand me this. I, it's not hey. you we want to see. What does he want? He wants you to communicate with me. <laughs> that's what he's saying. You're not communicating. Or he thinks you're a communist. Yeah, that's right. Or perhaps we should do a commercial. Let's do a commercial. There for, it is. Is this for the love line? Is that coming on now? <laughs> you know, there's that woman at the end, the blonde. She does that thing. They wrap up the commercial. Well, she goes, mm, I think this would be really good for you. Meet someone special. Call the love line. I think it'll be really good for you. You know, she seems to know me. She <laughs> seems to know what's good for me. I will call. <laughs> that and the other commercial I think you can look forward to on this break is Craftmatic. Or the contour chair. Yeah, with Art Linkletter. Doesn't Art Linkletter sell yeah. the contour chair? Now here's a fitness philosophy. Perhaps weak joints, stiff muscles, bad circulation. Perhaps you're too active. You know? <laughs> Perhaps you need to lie down more. Watch more TV. But get your legs up. Get your head back. This, 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 now how do you feel? <laughs> you know, apparently like the that's key, your problem. Apparently the key is to get your legs elevated above your heart. Right. But with no effort. <laughs> so if someone else can kind of just crank you up and your toes are above <laughs> the level of your left ventricle, you'll live forever. Yeah, you'll live forever. You see the guy, he's got the big gut there, you know, and right. he's smiling like, I feel fantastic. All my fitness problems are solved. Dave, come here. Look at this. They, ne they, they, don't, they never run out. He had, he, had a big, he had a big sign like this. Yeah. It tells you how this segment is going. He has a big sign like this, but he's got yeah. a fallback sign yeah. like let's, this. Let's keep going. Let's keep going until he comes out with a business card. <laughs> mm, I think this commercial will be really good for you. <laughs> Letterman called you the most imitated comic working today. What do you want me think to do? Think it's maybe true? I don't know. I'm not aware of it. I don't... Everybody, comedians, when they're starting out, they always imitate people. And then if you're any good, that has to fall away and you have to find a voice. A comedian has to find his voice and his rhythm the way a singer has to find the songs that fit mm -hmm. them. Who did you copy? I copied uh, Carlin, Robert Klein, Jay Leno. Um, I actually copied... Larry David, the guy who I wrote with on the show, I copied him. You, 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 you can't resist it. When you're on stage, a comedian is a scared animal. You know, you ever catch a deer in the headlights? That's, right. that's what a comic feels like inside. I mean, it's a, it's a fairly, uh, you know, desperate situation in the beginning when you don't know what you're doing. And you'll grab at things. You know, you'll pick up just sounds and do them. But eventually it gets to a point where you know there's certain stuff that can't fail. No, no such thing as can't fail in comedy. Any comedian can fail at any time. It's, uh, you have to like that. You have, because it's scary a little bit every time. And you have to kind of like it. Is it possible to be on tour? And let's say you're in Kansas City one night and you present a joke or a series of jokes that kind of blend together exactly the same way in Kansas City as you do the next night in Dallas and it works big in KC and in Dallas nobody laughs? No, you screwed it up. You think that in your mind. You think, I, I did the joke. This is a great joke. It always works. 
it's them, you know, but it's never them. An audience is a perfect uh, response meter. And that's why comedians get angry, because they deep down know that. And they know they screwed it up. It's, uh, it's incredible how little it takes to screw up a joke. It's incredible. It's the same idea, the same words, the same, everything is the same. But if I just say, uh, 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 it's not funny at all. I don't understand that. How does, how does a comic work up his act? How many times, when you see a guy come out, let's say for his first shot on a Letterman show, his first shot on the Tonight Show, you say to yourself, this guy must have done this in front of a mirror a hundred times. No, mirrors don't laugh. You gotta do it in front of an audience. A, com a good stand-up is not doing a monologue, he's doing a dialogue. And the laughs fit into the pauses just right. That's what timing is, is balancing your response and their response mm -hmm. so that it has a, 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 sounds like a dialogue. And audiences respond when they sense that you're listening to them. That's what builds a role. That's, that's one of the uh, subtle techniques of stand-up is you must create a dialogue with the audience in the laughter. People think that you rehearse it alone. You can't. You have to rehearse with them because they have a part in the show. And they, and they respond based on how well you are listening to their... Good comedians listen really closely to the audience. Every laugh has information in it, has, you know, the size of it and the tone of it. It tells you things about, unbelievable things about the audience. You can learn how much money people make from the certain way the laugh goes down. I mean, it's amazing. Have you got in your head, plotted out, certain approaches for different kinds of audiences, or do you just feel it? If you came out, if you came out at some fundraiser where the people were a little bit older and, and maybe a little more conservative, yeah. would you know that instantly, or would you feel it by the early response? You can tell by just walking out, usually, what you've got. I mean, they tell you, you know. I mean, what kind of crowd is it, they'll tell you. Yeah. But uh, if I, uh, most of the time, if I'm just walking out doing a regular show, I have no idea who's out there. And you can tell pretty quickly from the laughs, you know, what kind of mood they're in, and, and you have to change it, you know. People, ah, they were in a bad mood. Well, comedians always complain, you know. They weren't good, they weren't... Well, of course they're not. They're not in a good mood. That's why they came here. You know, that's your job. <laughs> what works before a college crowd? Anything. Just show up. <laughs> college crowds are wonderful. Superman material. Yeah. It's very good. Sophisticated stuff. <laughs> Any no. reference to Inspector Henderson college works crowds well. College crowds are so excited that they're not learning. You know? <laughs> they are so thrilled that they don't have to know this. You know? Because after every person that talks to them in their normal day, they have to have absorbed something. And with a comedian, you don't have to know anything. So they're just really, they're wonderful audiences. They're the best. And yet they do absorb it. Because I've seen people yeah. backstage with you and, uh, and other comedians, and they come up and start reciting what they think are your best lines yeah. or your best routines verbatim. Nobody has any idea how unfunny a comedian's act is to that comedian. <laughs> there is nothing funny about your act. It's like, you know, people come up and they think you're still thinking about this stuff, you know, and they want to have fun with you, like, yeah. like you want to keep talking about cotton balls. But, you know, it's a natural thing when you bump into a comic, if you really think the guy is funny and you really admire him, what are you going to say? The opener is to cite something that he said that really tickled you. The first time I met you was probably five years ago. And the only thing I could think right. of to say was the bit about the fattest man in the world. Yeah, but you didn't do the bit. You just no, said, I thought that's that was true. funny. You didn't, you know, pretend like I'm thinking about this nonstop. Right, strike your poses and, and, yeah. and go into your act. I, had, I was having uh, dinner the other night with three other comedians. We're sitting there at a Chinese restaurant, all, guy, all guys that are on TV. Somebody comes over and tries to be funny. You know, and I'm thinking, would you do that? I mean, would I go up to, like, Miles Davis and go, you know what I think is a good song? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, these guys, I don't know. I just don't understand sometimes what would possess... I guess you think, if I can make these guys laugh, then I'm funny, too. But comedians don't laugh most of the time. You know, you just... Are they go, morose as a group? Well, they're just so familiar. We're so, um, you know, uh, fluent in any type of comedic device that the only thing you can really say when you hear something funny is, that's funny. That will work, you know. Does a comedian have to, uh, have to incorporate some sort of social commentary in order to be great? 
Mm, now, you, don't do, you don't do much social commentary. No, I don't do any. You're very funny, but somebody might say, Seinfeld is funny, but Carlin, Pryor, yeah. people like that, they're transcendent. Yeah, I would, I would probably agree with that. Yeah, I, uh, I think, yeah, social commentary or a deeper thought, my, I'm interested in the shallowest of things, you know? And uh, that's fine. Those are, I like a lot of comedians like that, you know? I think there's a place for just comedy. You know, that isn't really that um, earth-shaking. Um, but, uh, yeah, to be great, I, I don't think you have to comment socially. I think you have to reveal something about your humanity. And I think any comedian could do that. I think some of the greatest things about Pryor was, was not that he commented on classes or social, but he captured a humanity mm -hmm. about people. Um, when he does the kid... Um, trying to lie about breaking the lamp, you know. Yeah. That's not social commentary, but that is comedy elevated to a dimension. That's not a flat character, that kid. It's not somebody I bumped into. It's not, that's a human being. That's what makes a comedian great, in my mind. A guy like Robert Klein, uh, who you cite as an influence, sort of splits the difference. Some of what he does has an element of social commentary. Much of it has humanity. But some of it is just a guy who's kind of funny and could yeah. have been the class cut up, making you laugh again. Yeah. Well, Klein really thinks a lot about his stuff, you know, and that's what makes him terrific. It's not just, he doesn't, nothing's really thrown away. It's, he's, all, he's given everything thought. You called him the father of 80s comedy. Yeah, absolutely. Him and Carlin, we were talking last night with uh, some comics about how AM and FM determined, that was the line. Mm-hmm. Everything after that, George Carlin's uh, album there, that set the tone, the style, for what comedy would be now, from now on. He said, he came out and said, this is what it was, and now we're, I'm going to change it into this. I don't think he realized that he was changing it for so many comedians. If you live in Beverly, Massachusetts, Jerry Seinfeld is coming to your town soon. If you live in Maryville, Indiana, the same is true. If you don't live in either of those two places, tune in Seinfeld tomorrow night, 9.30 Eastern Time, right after Cheers, here on NBC. Our thanks to Jerry and to you, and we're gone. See you later. He'll make your hair stand on ends. It's Don King tomorrow on Later.